Basics of Mid-Acts Dispensationalism, Part 1 of 2 Definitions Mid-Acts, since the Book of Acts has 28 chapters, the midpoint would be between chapters 14 and 15, so, the term mid-acts is not arithmetically correct. Mid-Acts, in the dispensational context, refers to the ninth chapter because that is when Jesus Christ began his dealings with the Apostle Paul. Some might also point to the 13th chapter because it is there that Paul first makes a statement that some in Israel considered worthy of death. Acts 13 verses 38 to 39, Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. Forgiveness through Christ, rather than by performance of Moses' law, was the message the Lord entrusted to Paul, hence the doctrine which would follow from that would properly be called Pauline. Dispensationalism has been defined by many authors, but seldom will you ever read an objective definition, since the topic is not without controversy. Those who oppose the concept reveal their predilection in their definition, as does Dr. Charles Cottle Ryrie. Those who favor the concept are no more objective, with a notable example being Charles F. Baker. If we allow the Bible to be our authority, it is readily apparent that God has not always dispensed the same information to the same people at all. Times. Significantly, the Bible contains information which everyone could know since the world began, and the Bible also contains information which no one could know until Christ imparted it to Paul. Acts 3 verse 21, Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Romans 16 verse 25, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, the importance of mid-Acts Pauline dispensationalism lies in the differentiation between that which had been prophesied and that which was a mystery until Christ revealed it to the Apostle Paul. Some of the differences are minor, and this book will not major on the minors. Rather, presented here are the basics of mid-acts dispensationalism. Rightly dividing is not optional. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15 is not a suggestion, study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That the Bible has divisions and it cannot be argued, there is the Old Testament and the New Testament, and everyone would agree to those divisions. Amazingly, most everyone would say that the Old Testament begins with Genesis chapter 1 and that the New Testament begins with the first chapter of Matthew, and that means most everyone would be wrong. Since the Old Testament is the giving of the law, that could not begin until the covenant of the law actually is delivered in Exodus 19.1 since the New Testament could not take effect without the death of the testator, that could not be before Christ dies on the cross.2. From this we see that our ideas as to where the Old and New Testament start were not a function of Bible study, and so we must allow the Bible to correct our wrong thinking. Those title pages in our Bibles announcing Old Testament and New Testament were placed in a convenient location by the Bible publishers, but the placement of those pages taught us wrong things about Bible doctrine. Additionally, we will see that Christ gave instructions to the Apostle Paul which are neither New nor Old Testament doctrine, but rather according to a mystery which had been hidden since before the world began. Recognizing this mystery and respecting the importance of this mystery to God's wise plan to glorify Christ both in heaven and on the earth is the key to understanding the Bible and is the focus of this book. None of us would want to be guilty of wrongly dividing the word of truth or of rejecting all the counsel of God. 3. We are guilty of both of those indiscretions if we fail to recognize and respect the revelation of the mystery which the Lord Jesus Christ delivered to the Apostle Paul beginning in the ninth chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. 1. Exodus 19 verse 5 Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall I'll be a peculiar treasure unto me above all el people, for all el the earth is mine. 2. Matthew 26 verse 28 For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. 3. Timothy 2.15 Study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 4. Acts 20 verse 27 For I have not shunned to declare unto you all, all the counsel of God. We must recognize and respect the revelation of the mystery. The Bible declares that Jesus Christ revealed the mystery to the Apostle Paul. 
In Ephesians 3 verse 3, Paul writes that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words. We read about the mystery in Paul's writings, but for more than 4,000 years it hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, according to Colossians 1 verse 26. None of the twelve apostles was privy to this mystery as Paul declares, I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ, according to Galatians 1 verse 12. Before the creation, before Adam and Eve, the God had a Father, Son, and Spirit had planned this mystery and ordained when Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, would speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 7. We are to engage in the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, Romans 16 verse 25, which clearly differs from Peter's message which was spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began, according to Acts 3 verse 21. Although most Christians think of stewardship in terms of money and other resources, we are to be stewards of the mysteries of God and faithful stewards at that. 1 Corinthians 4 verses 1 to 2. I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. Romans 11 verse 25. And so we cannot be pleasing to God by choosing to be ignorant of mystery truth. The Lord stopped winking at ignorance back in Acts 17 verse 301, and so, we must get back to the basics, the three R's, recognize and respect the revelation of the mystery. Now that we have recognized the existence of this mystery and that it was given by Christ to Paul, we next must learn the content of this revelation. With that knowledge, we will come to respect the importance and impact of the mystery on our biblical understanding. The revelation of the mystery is a term which describes the body of new information which Christ imparted to Paul, and there are six most important aspects to this mystery truth. 1. Israel is blind and fallen, and as a result, a new salvation program comes to Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 11, through their fall salvation is come unto the Gentiles. 1. Romans 11 verse 25, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. 2. God's dealings with humanity changes too. The dispensation of the grace of God which is given me, Paul, to you ward. Ephesians 3 verse 2 Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles. Ephesians 3 verse 5 Apart from the law, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Romans 6 verse 14 And without Israel, for I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Acts 10 verse 34 3. Humanity's dealings with God change because of the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, Colossians 1 verse 26, which entails a new relationship with Christ because God now has made to whom God would make known what the riches of the glory of this mystery is among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians 1 verse 27. 4. The focus becomes a new creature, the body of Christ, with Christ as the head, rather than Israel's kingdom over which Christ will be king, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. Colossians 1 verse 18, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. 5. The Lord has us here on earth as his ambassadors, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, and the Lord would have us to see souls saved and saints edified, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. 6. Rather than ruling on the earth with the tribes of Israel, we will meet Jesus Christ in heavenly places, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 51, Behold, I shew you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 16 to 17, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so, shall we ever be with the Lord. 
Now that we have recognized the existence of the mystery and that it was given by Christ to Paul, and now that we have briefly identified the six points of doctrinal content, we are prepared to learn to respect the importance and impact of the mystery on our biblical understanding. That will entail a study of the basics of mid-Acts dispensationalism. 1. Acts 17 verse 30 And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commendeth all men everywhere to repent. Israel and the body of Christ are different. Rather than Christ's 12 apostles sent to Israel, Paul says, I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office, Romans 11 verse 13, the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, Romans 15 verse 16, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, Ephesians 3 verse 1, and Paul alone refers to this present time period in which we live as the dispensation of the grace of God, Ephesians 3 verse 2. Instead of Israel's being, for a light of the Gentiles, Isaiah 42 verse 6, Paul alone states the fact that a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 17, and rather than following in the footsteps of Christ, Paul calls himself the pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. 1 Timothy 1 verse 16, God sent his son, subsequently, his son sent Paul, signaling a change in God's administration, no doubt much better said, dispensation. In this present dispensation of grace, salvation now is being dispensed, or administered, to uncircumcised Gentiles by grace through faith alone without the works of the law, Ephesians 2 verses 8 to 9, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Titus 3 verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, Israel found righteous standing by performing in accordance with the law, Deuteronomy 6 verse 25, and it shall be our righteousness, if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he hath commanded us. The Lord Jesus Christ himself affirmed the need for performance when he talked about, they that have done good, unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil, unto the resurrection of damnation. John 5 verse 29. Clearly there has been a dispensational change of administration in that salvation now is, to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Romans 4 verse 5. Grace and works cannot be combined or accumulated because they are mutually exclusive according to Romans 11 verse 6. If by grace, then is it no more of works, otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise, work is no more work. Clearly, there has been a dispensational change of administration which no one saw coming at the time and many have yet to see even today. However, until God revealed this mystery to Paul, this dispensation of grace in which we live and its doctrinal content had never been revealed. Paul clearly states that this present dispensation was not previously made known, revealed, unto the sons of men, Ephesians 3 verses 1 to 6, for this cause I Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby, when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. The revelation of the mystery in this dispensation is as important to see and understand as seeing and understanding the iceberg would have been for the captain of the Titanic, and the consequences of not knowing are even more dire. For God's eternal truth requires right division. The Bible often refers to Israel as the circumcision because of the covenant of circumcision which God instituted. Gentiles often are referred to as the uncircumcision and strangers because Gentiles had no such covenant and were strangers to it. Ephesians 2 verse 12, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. The simple difference between the circumcision and the uncircumcision stands as proof that this dispensation of the mystery could not have been a subject during the times targeting the circumcision because during those times the uncircumcision had no hope. Genesis 17 verse 14, And the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people, he hath broken my covenant. 
Exodus 12 verse 48, And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee, and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it, and he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. Ezekiel 44 verses 7 to 9, And that ye have brought into my sanctuary strangers, uncircumcised in heart, and uncircumcised in flesh, to be in my sanctuary, to pollute it, even my house, when ye offer my bread, the fat, and the blood, and they have broken my covenant because of all your abominations. And ye have not kept the charge of mine holy things, but ye have set keepers of my charge in my sanctuary for yourselves. Thus, saith the Lord God, no stranger, uncircumcised in heart, nor uncircumcised in flesh, shall enter into my sanctuary, of any stranger that is among the children of Israel. The body of prophetic information in the Bible constitutes that which was well known, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, Luke 1 verse 70, and nothing had changed well into Peter's ministry, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Acts 3 verse 21. Christ revealed new information to Paul and so Paul has some things very different to say. Colossians 1 verses 25 to 27, whereof I am made a minister, according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. These verses and those in Ephesians chapter 3 prove that this present dispensation was made known to Paul after having been hidden and never foretold in prophecy. To miss this as one navigates, through God's word inevitably leads to shipwreck. Paul's writings alone contain God's dispensational information for the body of Christ, information which had been hidden from God's prophetic administration involving Israel. When the Titanic hit the iceberg and sank, it was said that 1,523 souls were lost, that would be doctrinally true only for the unsaved victims of that disaster. Meanwhile, every soul that fails to trust the gospel of the grace of God preached according to the revelation of the mystery is eternally shipwrecked and lost in hell. Rightly dividing is not optional. The Lord Jesus Christ and his twelve apostles preached to Israel, and the content of the message was identified as the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 4 verse 23, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Matthew 9 verse 35, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Matthew 24 verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. It is very important to note that the gospel of the kingdom did not include the cross, Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, as that information was still hidden from understanding. Mark 9 verses 31 to 32, For he taught his disciples, and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. But they understood not that saying, and were afraid to ask him. Luke 9 verses 44 to 45, Let these sayings sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. But they understood not this saying, and it was hid from them, that they perceived it not, and they feared to ask him of that saying. John 20 verse 9, For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. The apostle Peter had been given the keys to the prophetic program, and yet when the prince of the apostles was told about the cross, Peter tried to prevent the crucifixion from taking place. Since Peter, the Lord, and the rest of the apostles had been preaching the gospel of the kingdom for some time, it is obvious that the gospel of the kingdom could not have included the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Matthew 16 verses 21 to 22, From that time forth began Jesus to shew unto his disciples, how that he must go unto Jerusalem, and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him, and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Unlike the gospel of the kingdom, Paul declares that his gospel, the gospel of the grace of God, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, is all about Calvary's cross. 
1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 4, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Since the focus of the gospel of the kingdom is the kingdom of that gospel, there can be no mistaking that it belonged to Israel and had been prophesied. Luke 1 verses 68 to 70 Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. In contrast to this present dispensation of grace, the gospel of the kingdom was not a mystery at all, because prophecy clearly stated that God's kingdom was to be established literally at some future point, with Jerusalem at its center. The focus of God's prophetic program for Israel, the focus of the gospel of the kingdom, was and will again be Christ ruling on this earth. Daniel 7 verse 14, And there was given him dominion, and glory, and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages, should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Revelation 11 verse 15, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord, and of his Christ, and he shall reign for ever and ever. The focus of the gospel of the grace of God preached according to the revelation of the mystery is not about a physical kingdom on earth, but spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Ephesians 1 verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 40, There are also celestial bodies, and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 47, The first man is of the earth, earthy, the second man is the Lord from heaven. Because Israel rejected Christ and his prophetic message of the kingdom, Israel fell, and the kingdom ceased to be at hand. Because Israel has fallen, salvation is come to the Gentiles, not with the gospel of the rejected kingdom, but with the gospel of the grace of God. Because prophecies concerning Gentile salvation through the glorification of Israel would be through the kingdom gospel, they could not be the same as Gentile salvation which comes through the fall of Israel. That means there are prophecies for Israel that have yet to be fulfilled, and just as the mystery program was not operating during Israel's time, Israel's program is not operating now. When the part of the mystery program involving the removal of the body of Christ into heavenly places occurs, God then will complete Israel's prophetic program. Because salvation of uncircumcised Gentiles never was foretold or accommodated during the law program or during the earthly ministry of Christ, this present dispensation involves an administration of God that was unprophesied dispensationalism simply recognizes the differences between Israel and the body of Christ. Dispensationalism respects the doctrinal impact of the differences between Israel and the body of Christ and responds accordingly. Dispensationalism accepts what the Bible says but also respects to whom it says it. Dispensationalists realize that God has different things to say to the body of Christ than he had said to Israel, just as certainly as Israel's gospel of the kingdom did not include the preaching of the cross. Dispensationalists recognize that while all God's Bible is for our learning, not all of God's word is written to us for our doctrinal application. More specifically, Mid-Acts dispensationalism is based upon the fact that the present body of Christ began with the Apostle Paul, when he was saved in Acts chapter 9 and as the Lord gave to Paul the revelation of the mystery which had been so long hidden. Before he met the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul had been named Saul, and Saul was a Gentile, Roman, following the Jewish religion, Sanhedrin. Acts 21 verse 39 But Paul said, I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus. Acts 22 verse 25 Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? Philippians 3 verse 5 Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. When Christ saved Saul and gave him the revelation of the mystery, Saul became Paul, a new creature, Jew, and Gentile in one body, the body of Christ, in which there is neither Jew nor Greek. Israel and the body of Christ are different. Gospel of the kingdom, gospel of God's grace, are different.
While sincere people will tell you that everyone in the Bible gets saved the same way, such is not the testimony of scripture. While popular preachers proclaim that everyone in the Old Testament was saved by looking forward to the cross just as everyone in the New Testament is saved by looking backward to the cross, such is not the testimony of scripture. While there may be a visceral response to first hearing that there is more than one plan of salvation in the Bible, it should not be our gut but our careful study of God's words that we trust. While this chapter may elicit a knee-jerk reaction, come let us reason together and see what the Bible has to say, remembering that even Paul kicked against the truth until the Lord showed Paul a more excellent way. The books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are referred to as the four Gospels, but that is not what we are talking about here. The word gospel means good news and our interest is in noticing that there are several messages of good news in the Bible, and the good news message in the four Gospels is that of the kingdom. Our good news gospel message is that Christ died for our sins. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel by which also ye are saved how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 4. Righteous standing for Adam and Eve involved avoiding a particular tree, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Genesis 2 verse 17, Righteous standing was accorded Noah because he built the ark, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Genesis 6 verse 8. Note the combination of Noah's faith with the required performance required of him, Genesis 7 verse 5 and Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. Hebrews 11 verse 7 By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Righteous standing was imputed to Abraham because by faith Abraham believed the covenant promises which Jehovah God had given, for what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Romans 4 verse 3, Righteousness was available to Moses and the children of Israel contingent upon performance of the commandments of God, and the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive, as it is at this day. And it shall be our righteousness, if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he hath commanded us. Deuteronomy 6 verses 24 to 25. Paul reaffirms that under the law righteous standing was the product of prescribed performance, for Moses describeth the righteousness, which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them, yet according to the revelation of the mystery Christ gave to Paul. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Romans 10 colon 5, 10 colon 4. Significantly, the law and the prophets were until John, since that time the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. Luke 16 verse 16, And so, while the kingdom being at hand is added, there is nothing in the verse to indicate that either the law or the prophetic doctrines had ceased. Rather, think not that I am come to destroy the law, or the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Matthew 5 verse 17, 4. God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, Galatians 4 verse 4, eternal life was the subject of a question asked of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 19 verse 16, and, behold, one came and said unto him, Good Master, what good thing shall I do, that I may have eternal life? It is important to notice what the Lord did not say, he did not say, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. He did not say, By grace are ye saved through faith. He did not say, salvation is a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. What Jesus Christ in fact did say was perfectly consistent with the required performance under the law program, but if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Matthew 19 verse 17, prior to the Lord's crucifixion, the apostles never understood that Jesus had to die, much less that he would die for the sins of uncircumcised Gentiles. What the apostles did not know, however, did not preclude their preaching the gospel of the kingdom because the gospel of the kingdom does not include Christ's death on Calvary's cruel cross. Matthew 4 verse 23, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. 
Matthew 9 verse 35, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Jesus and his apostles meant what they were saying, the kingdom was literally at hand, and the culmination of the prophetic program was soon to be. This explains why physical healing is always associated with the gospel of the kingdom as Israel would soon be the chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. 1 Peter 2 verse 9, to be a priest in the holy nation Israel requires that a person be physically whole, Leviticus 21 verses 17 to 23, and that is why physical healing is always associated with Israel's gospel of the kingdom. John the Baptist first began preaching that the kingdom of heaven was at hand in Matthew 3 verses 1 to 2, in those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus himself also preached, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 4 verse 17, and just six verses later, this message that Jesus preached is properly referred to as the gospel of the kingdom, and Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Matthew 4 verse 23, preaching that the kingdom was at hand and granting physical healing in preparation for that kingdom, then, is what constitutes preaching the gospel of the kingdom. While it is true that Jesus spoke of his death, burial, and resurrection several times in the four gospels, the apostles never understood, and it was hidden from them. It would be gross error to read into the Gospels that which was not understood. Luke 9 verses 44 to 45, Let these sayings sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. But they understood not this saying, and it was hid from them, that they perceived it not, and they feared to ask him of that saying. Mark also demonstrates that while he and the rest of the disciples were preaching the gospel of the kingdom, they did not understand what would become the elements of the gospel of the grace of God, Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, Mark 9 verses 30 to 32, and they departed thence and passed through Galilee, and he would not that any man should know it. For he taught his disciples, and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. But they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him. There are many other passages documenting the fact that the twelve apostles never realized Jesus would die on the cross only to resurrect from the dead, as they went forth preaching the gospel of the kingdom. One of the most illuminating involves Peter, already preaching the gospel of the kingdom, already in possession of the keys to the kingdom as well as binding and losing power, Peter attempted to prevent the crucifixion, Matthew 16 verses 21 to 23, from that time forth began Jesus to shew unto his disciples, how that he must go unto Jerusalem, and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him, and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Just prior to the actual events taking place, the apostles still lacked understanding, Luke 18 verses 31 to 34, Then he took unto him the twelve, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on, and they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. And they understood none of these things, and this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. Even when the Lord was taken to be crucified, Peter still did not realize that Christ would die and be resurrected. Otherwise, he would not have cut off the ear of the high priest's servant in a failed attempt to prevent the crucifixion, John 18 verses 10 to 11, Then Simon Peter having a sword drew it, and smote the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath, the cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Even immediately after the resurrection had taken place, there was neither understanding nor rejoicing. John 20 9 For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Paul reveals that the mystery was hidden from the princes of this world so that the Lord could confound his enemies. 1 Corinthians 2 verses 7 to 8 
but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. This makes it very clear as we read through the four Gospels that neither Christ nor his apostles could have been preaching the Gospel by which we are saved because the Gospel of the Kingdom they preach does not include the doctrinal information by which we are saved, namely, faith in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection on our behalf. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the Gospel, by which also ye are saved. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 4. After preaching the gospel of the kingdom for more than three years it remained true that the people of the four gospels did not know what Paul would learn from the resurrected Christ. The fact that Christ was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Romans 4 verse 25 was mystery information delivered to Paul, information the apostles never comprehended. When this dispensation and its doctrines operating according to the revelation of the mystery concludes, God will be at liberty to complete Israel's kingdom program as prophesied. Micah 4 verses 1 to 3, But in the last days it shall come to pass, that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come, and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, and to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for the law shall go forth of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among many people, and rebuke strong nations afar off, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks, nation shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Jesus said, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Matthew 24 verse 14, And the end has not yet come. Paul said, The hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I Paul am made a minister, Colossians 1 verse 23. And since the end did not come when every creature had heard, clearly the gospel Paul preached was not the gospel of the kingdom but rather the gospel of the grace of God. Acts 20 verse 24. Today, in this present dispensation of grace, the kingdom is no longer being offered to Israel, as they rejected their kingdom and crucified their king. God's prophesied kingdom temporarily has been set aside, and it is no longer at hand. The gospel of the kingdom that the apostles were preaching does not apply to this present dispensation, because there is no salvation today apart from the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the grace of God are different. We cannot read back into scripture that which is revealed later. The reader of the Bible often approaches the word of God as if it were, as so many have said, God's love letter from heaven, the idea being that every word is expressly ours to believe and cherish. We are right to believe and cherish every word of God, but we would be terribly wrong to think that all of the doctrines contained in the Bible were for us to perform trying to drink any deadly thing, Mark 16 verse 17, or stoning the people who don't observe the Sabbath, Numbers 15 colon 32-36, for example. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, Hebrews 1 verse 1, from this one verse we see God speaking to the fathers and to no one else. We see God speaking at sundry, various, times in divers, different, manners, and we must learn to respect those variations. The reader of the Bible often starts at Genesis and reads through to the end of the Revelation, accumulating everything read into one belief system. Actually, few things could be more wrong, as the Bible contains progressive revelation, with newer information often supplanting the old. While in the Garden of Eden, God required that Adam and Eve be vegetarians, Genesis 1 verse 29, and God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree, and the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. As yet, sin had not entered, there was no curse upon the earth, and so God had Adam caring for the animals, not eating them. Romans 5 verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so, death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned, with the advent of sin and humanity's expulsion from the garden, the earth was cursed, and God killed an animal to clothe Adam and Eve. Things had changed. Subsequently, 
Genesis 9 verse 3, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have, I given you all things. God's purpose in changing the dietary program was to illustrate that the wages of sin is death, to demonstrate that what went on in the garden had been supplanted with a new program. Practically speaking, chasing down animals for food would encourage people to spread out around the globe, since the garden was now off limits. Most everyone knows that Jehovah God gave Israel a dietary program in which were acceptable clean animals and forbidden unclean animals. This would be a third set of dietary instructions, and clearly, they cannot be accumulated or combined, they must be rightly divided. Even though Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, which means that Moses wrote all three of the dietary programs contained in those books, Moses was required to obey what was written in Leviticus, not what was written in Genesis. Moses could not pick his favorite and disregard the others. Moses could not accumulate and combine the programs, as they were mutually exclusive. Moses had to respect progressive revelation, for even though God had inspired the one man, Moses, and Moses had written the first five books of the Bible, clearly God, at sundry times and in divers' manners spake. Hebrews 1 verse 1, new information had supplanted that which had been in place previously, and it would have been wrong to read Genesis as if it said the same thing as Leviticus and vice versa. Our dietary instructions are different still, and we have no more authority to pick a favorite or accumulate doctrines than did Moses. Paul tells us that, the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, and doctrines of devils, commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. 1 Timothy 4 verses 1 to 4, amazing and illuminating, Adam and Eve were told by God to be vegetarians, and that same instruction is a doctrine of devils in Paul's letter to Timothy. Even under the law in Leviticus, certain meats were forbidden and so every creature of God was not good back then, as they are said to be in 1 Timothy. Understanding this concept of progressive revelation, whereby doctrines do not accumulate and combining doctrines is wrong, prepares our minds to consider again just how wrong it is to read back into a text those doctrines that are not actually revealed until later. The content of a well-known messianic prophecy provides an excellent example, illustrating this truth, although Isaiah chapter 53 is a prophecy that Christ was to be wounded for someone's transgressions, and that he would be bruised for someone's iniquities, our present understanding of this prophecy is based upon subsequent explanations revealed in the scriptures, because the passage in Isaiah is not very specific. While the apostles undoubtedly were familiar with this Old Testament passage, its application was hidden from them as they went forth preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Even though we now know that Isaiah chapter 53 is a prophecy about the crucifixion of Jesus, which Philip explained to the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, we have the advantage of both New Testament and Pauline scriptures to explain this. The apostles, though, did not yet possess this understanding prior to the Lord's resurrection. It was essential for the Lord's then future crucifixion to remain hidden during the time that the gospel of the kingdom was being that the gospel of the kingdom was being ate, that if the princes of this world had known about it, they would not have crucified the Lord, and this present dispensation never would have come to pass. Therefore, when it is read with the limited understanding which the apostles had at that time, Isaiah 53 is indeed a cryptic passage, Isaiah 53 verses 1 to 12, who hath believed our report. And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely, he hath borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows, Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? 
For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he hath put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. We must remember the imperfect understanding the apostles had at the time concerning prophecies such as Isaiah 53 and be careful not to read our own understanding into their actions. We are able to see through the darkened glass of obscure prophetic scriptures, but that would not mean the twelve apostles understood these passages before they were fulfilled. While the apostles may have understood the Messiah had to die, they did not know it would be by crucifixion, and Isaiah makes no mention of the resurrection. A number of Christians today believe that the New Testament, or the New Covenant, began with the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Old Testament, then, is thought to end immediately after the book of Malachi, with the birth of Jesus in Matthew beginning the New Testament. The Lord, though, inspired the author of the book of Hebrews to draw the line at the death of Jesus, and not at his birth. The author of Hebrews states that a testament requires the death of the testator and is only in force after death. Therefore, the actual New Testament could not have begun with the birth of Jesus, according to Hebrews 9 verses 15 to 18, and for this because he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead, otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. While this may surprise many who do not take a dispensational approach to Bible study, it is clear from this passage that the New Testament could not have begun with the birth of Christ but rather with his death. As a matter of fact, Jesus himself stated that the New Testament was to be implemented through his blood, Mark 14 verses 23 to 24, and he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. The New Testament, then, could not have begun with the birth of the Christ child in the manger, as so many Christians are led to believe. Instead, it is only for convenience that the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, have been separated from the Greek scriptures that were written after the birth of Jesus, the so-called New Testament. Yet this convenience has actually become a tradition that has taught great error. Thus, in order to rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, we must be careful to allow the inspired scriptures themselves to be our final authority. Because the New Testament did not begin with the birth of Jesus, this example serves to illustrate the fact that man's traditions, no matter how sincere they may be, actually can lead us astray. We must not read back into scripture that which is revealed later. We cannot claim Israel's promises. The entity the Bible refers to as Israel is a nation of people, and yet they are so much more. They are God's chosen people one, God's elect people two, the people of God's covenants three, a peculiar people identified by the token of circumcision. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. Genesis 17 verse 11. With this covenant, the Lord required Abraham, and subsequently all Israel, to be circumcised, along with all males in his household. Circumcision was not an option, it was a requirement. The uncircumcised man was to be cut off from his people, according to Genesis 17 verses 13 to 14, He that is born in thy house, and he that is bought with thy money, must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people, he hath broken my covenant. In stark contrast, and as a product of the revelation of the mystery, Paul says, Galatians 6 verse 15, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new. 
creature to partake of the Passover required circumcision. Exodus 12 verses 48 to 49, And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee, and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it, and he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. One law shall be to him that is home-born, and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. In stark contrast, as a product of the revelation of the mystery, Paul says, For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7, Circumcised Israel was always to maintain separation from the uncircumcised Gentiles, as Isaiah clearly stated, Isaiah 52 verse 1, Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion, put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Ezekiel also states that no uncircumcised stranger shall enter the Lord's sanctuary, Ezekiel 44 verse 9, Thus, saith the Lord God, no stranger, uncircumcised in heart, nor uncircumcised in flesh, shall enter into my sanctuary, of any stranger that is among the children of Israel. In stark contract, as a product of the revelation of the mystery, Paul says. Romans 10 verse 12, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Romans 3 verse 22, Even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all of them that believe for there is no difference. Galatians 5 verses 1 to 6 Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I Paul say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Spiritualizing Israel's circumcision will not work because Israel's circumcision was not spiritual but the actual cutting away of physical flesh. In stark contrast, as a product of the revelation of the mystery, Paul says, Colossians 2 verse 11, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Philippians 3 verse 3, For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. In addition, the Lord had called Israel to be his chosen people from the start and severed them from other people, the Gentiles, as the Bible clearly states, Leviticus 20 25 26, Ye shall therefore put difference between clean beasts and unclean, and between unclean fowls and clean, and ye shall not make your souls abominable by beast, or by fowl, or by any manner of living thing that creepeth on the ground, which I have separated from you as unclean. And ye shall be holy unto me, for I the Lord am holy, and have severed you from other people, that ye should be mine. Numbers 23, 9, Lo, the people shall dwell alone, and shall not be reckoned among the nations. With the fall of Israel, and in stark contrast, as a product of the revelation of the mystery, Paul, declares that the body of Christ involves every one member one of another. Romans 12 verse 5. Galatians 3 verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Understanding that we cannot claim Israel's promises is profound as it dismantles British Israelism, Aryan supremacy, manifest destiny, fulfillment of prophecy in 1948 and many other beliefs commonly held. How many people this very day, how many influential people in high government positions in the USA, Britain and other countries still hold to? Genesis 12 verse 3, And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. This blessing was to occur initially through Abraham's descendants, which the Bible refers to as Abraham's seed plural, numbered as the dust of the earth, Genesis 13 verses 14 to 16, And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward, for all the land which thou sayest, To thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. 
Genesis 26 verse 4, And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Blessings upon the plural seed were extended to Abraham's progeny Isaac, Exodus 35 verse 12, and Jacob, Genesis 28 verse 4, whose name was changed to Israel, Genesis 32 verse 28. And in each instance it is a vast number likened to the dust of the earth. Genesis 28 verse 14. In stark contrast, as a product of the revelation of the mystery, Paul presents the Lord Jesus Christ as the seed singular, not plural. Galatians 3 verse 16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. We must not allow our English word seed to be a source of confusion because its singularity or plurality is always identified by the immediate context. We are not confused when we have one seed in our hand or a 50-pound bag of seed on our shoulder, for we know the word seed can be either singular or plural, but not both at the same time. When God promised to bless those who blessed Abraham's seed, that promise concerned those who blessed the nation of Israel. Throughout the Old Testament, including the four Gospels prior to Calvary, those Gentiles who blessed Israel received the Lord's blessing, since Israel was his chosen nation. This explains the Lord Jesus' dealings with Gentiles in the four Gospels and makes what most people find to be difficult passages very easy to understand. Matthew 15 verses 22 to 28, And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts, and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away for she creeth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. 26. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread, and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. One need not make excuses for the Lord's being rude, one need not set forth that the Canaanite woman was being tested, one need not tell stories about the manners and customs of the people in the first century. One need only recognize that Jesus had come to Israel and this lady was a Gentile dog. When she gave testimony that she understood Israel's exalted position and her lowly status, the Lord blessed her in accordance with the promises made to Abraham's people when they had been blessed by a Gentile. That is exactly what goes on in Luke 7 verses 2 to 9, and a certain centurion servant, who was dear unto him, was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying, that he was worthy for whom he should do this, for he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them. And when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof, wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers, and I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned him about, and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. The Lord had committed himself to bless them who blessed Abraham's seed, plural, and since the centurion had built Israel a synagogue, the centurion was a recipient of the blessing promised. It was in this manner, then, that the Lord separated the nation of Israel and gave Israel the preeminence above all the other nations, and this continues during the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Christ Jesus we have the seed, singular, by which all people of the earth, without distinction, receive all spiritual blessings by faith in the gospel of Christ rather than by circumcision and the works of the law mandated by Israel's covenants. Christ, in his earthly ministry, was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, Romans 15 verse 8. 
No Gentiles were considered circumcision, and no Gentiles were given any promises according to Israel's covenants. Be reminded that the same people who were given the Old Testament are those who get the New Testament. Point four. At this present time, although Israel has rejected Jesus Christ as her Messiah, Christians gain no advantage in the Lord's eyes by blessing that nation, because salvation by grace alone is through the fall of Israel. Romans 11 verse 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their false salvation is come unto the Gentiles, for to provoke them to jealousy. Were you to receive a blessing today as a product of your having blessed Israel, that would be directly contrary to the one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 11. Paul would not have us to be ignorant of the fact that we cannot claim Israel's promises. Romans 11 verses 25 to 28, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so, all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Shaun the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Israel shall be saved, Israel shall be delivered, Israel will receive God's covenant promises to them. We are the body of Christ, we are not Israel. To miss that fact is to be blinded, an enemy of the gospel of the grace of God which is not according to Israel's promise but according to the revelation of the mystery. 1. Deuteronomy 7 verse 6 For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, the Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. 2. Jeremiah 45 verse 4 Thus halt thou say unto him, The Lord saith, Thus, behold, that which I have built will I break down, and that which I have planted I will pluck up, even this whole land. 3. Ephesians 2 verse 12 That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. 4. Jeremiah 31 verse 31 Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, and with the house of Judah. Hebrews 8 verse 8 For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. We cannot claim Israel's Messiah or Israel's commission. Few things in the Bible are more easily discerned than the fact that Jesus Christ was Israel's Messiah. It is easily discerned in prophecy, Ezekiel 3 verses 4 to 6, And he said unto me, Son of man, go, get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. For thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of an hard language, but to the house of Israel, not to many people of a strange speech and of an hard language, whose words thou canst not understand. Surely, had I sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto thee. It is easily discerned in ministry statements made by Christ himself, Matthew 10 verses 5 to 6, these twelve Jesus sent forth, and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It is easily discerned in Paul's statement defining Christ's ministry. Romans 15 verse 8, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, while we can recall the account of the Canaanite woman, a Gentile, who asked Christ to heal her daughter who was grievously vexed with the devil. We should remind ourselves here that the Lord initially refused to honor her request point one only after the Gentile woman acknowledged her own inferior position as a Gentile, thus effectively blessing the nation of Israel, the seed of Abraham, did he agree to heal her daughter in accordance with God's promise to Gentiles through Abraham. Point two, Jesus did not bless the Canaanite woman and heal her daughter because the dispensation of grace had begun, but rather because it hadn't. There is neither Jew nor Greek, Galatians 3 verse 28, in this present dispensation, which means that what took place in Matthew 15 could not happen now. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. John 1 verse 11. And while there were exceptions that did accept Christ as Israel's Messiah, the exceptions proved the rule. The Old.
Testament belongs to Israel, and we know from the book of Hebrews that the four gospel accounts prior to the cross are Old Testament in their doctrine point three. The four gospels record the prophesied rise of Israel into its earthly kingdom status, yet we know that Gentile salvation comes as a product of Israel's fall point for these things being true, one might ask, how could this happen? How could such obvious truth be missed? The answer is found in church history, for more than 1,000 years very few people had access to a Bible, and fewer yet read from Paul. David Daniel in the Bible in English says, a neat definition of the Reformation is people reading Paul. Whatever the reason, the Christian church long has been centered and focused upon the four Gospels, and the difficulties encountered in getting right division right are exacerbated by what happens immediately after the resurrection of the Lord. Rather than a new dispensation according to the revelation of the mystery, after the cross the law continues and the separation between Gentile and Israel is maintained. Instead of the second chapter of Acts being the birthday of a new church it is actually the near-death experience of old Israel. Peter recounted the promise Christ had made to Israel for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Acts 1 verse 5 it is the fruition of that promise to Israel that took place at Pentecost, and not the start of something new. The audience at Pentecost is identified clearly in Acts chapter 2 as being Jews, devout men, out of every nation, v5, ye men of Judea, v14, ye men of Israel, v22, all the house of Israel, v36. Even them that are far off, v39, would be people of Israel who did not make it to town for the feast of Pentecost. Further, Gentiles were not a part of Israel's feast program, nor were they included in the prophecy dealing with this event, Ezekiel 36 verses 24 to 28, For I will take you from among the heathen, and gather you out of all countries, and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean, from all your filthiness, and from all your idols, will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments, and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. Peter also stated that what Luke reported in Acts chapter 2 is about Israel's last days, Acts 2 verse 17, because, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, Acts 2 verse 16, and anything from prophecy could hardly be, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, Romans 16 verse 25, to include Gentiles or to misidentify the early chapters in the book of Acts as the body of Christ is difficult because Peter preached doctrine appropriate to the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 30 verse 7, the Holy Ghost comfort was promised to Israel and it was to Israel that Peter spoke. We can be certain of that fact because eight chapters later in the book of Acts, Peter said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation, but God hath shewed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Acts 10 verse 28 Peter could not have included Gentiles in Acts chapter 2 when it was not until Acts chapter 10 that Peter began to learn that things were changing. The them that are far off, Acts 2 verse 39, are well described in Daniel 9 verse 7, to the men of Judah, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and unto all Israel, that are near, and that are far off. Chronologically, between the four Gospels, which many wrongly believe to be the Christian pattern, and the early chapters of the book of Acts, which many wrongly believe to be the birthday of our church today, are situated the verses which most people wrongly believe to be our marching orders, the so-called Great Commission. Firstly, the Lord gave a pre-crucifixion commission which is very different in content to the post-resurrection commission, Matthew 10 verses 5 to 7, these twelve Jesus sent forth, and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Note that the Lord sent his disciples to all nations in the post-resurrection commission, Matthew 28 verses 19 to 20, Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and, lo, 
I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. The confusion is removed when we remember that the apostles themselves did not go to all nations as the verses in Matthew 28 required because they could not. They knew certain things had to take place first. The end had to come. Matthew 24 verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. The kingdom promised to Israel needed to be restored. Isaiah 52 verse 1, Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion, put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Ezekiel 44 verse 9, Thus, saith the Lord God, No stranger, uncircumcised in heart, nor uncircumcised in flesh, shall enter into my sanctuary, of any stranger that is among the children of Israel. The apostles, knowing that the prophesied sanctification of Gentiles must occur through the exaltation of Israel, had no reason to go directly to all nations in the Great Commission. Instead, they expected the kingdom to first be restored again to Israel, as their own words reflect, Acts 1 verses 6 to 8, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons, which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. The apostles' question in verse 6 demonstrates their understanding that the prophesied kingdom must first be established before the Gentiles could be made acceptable to the Lord. Because Israel was not being exalted, the apostles were clearly confined in their ministries to the nation Israel alone. 6. Before dealing with uncircumcised Gentiles, the apostles would first need to convert unbelieving Israel in preparation for Israel's kingdom, Luke 24 verse 47, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Notice the verse says among all nations, not to all nations, and as late as Acts 21 verse 20 believing Israel rejoiced in, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law, zealous of the law, not grateful for grace through faith. Since the prophesied kingdom had not yet been established, the apostles continued to confine their ministry to Israel alone, fully expecting the Jews to repent. The reality was that the prophesied kingdom with Israel at the head of the nations had yet to appear, and it wasn't going to. Deuteronomy 28 verses 10 to 13, And all people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy ground, in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to give thee. The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto thy land in his season, and to bless all the work of thine hand, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. And the Lord shall make thee the head, and not the tail, and thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath, if that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day, to observe and to do them. The apostles knew the so-called Great Commission required the rise of Israel, Yet what they were witnessing was Israel's fall. The Lord stopped the prophetic clock due to Israel's unbelief, and the Lord took away Israel's status and standing when Israel was declared to be stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Acts 7 verse 51 the apostles expected prophetic fulfillment of passages such as Zechariah 8 verses 20 to 23, Thus, saith the Lord of hosts, It shall yet come to pass, that there shall come people, and the inhabitants of many cities, and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go speedily to pray before the Lord, and to seek the Lord of hosts, I will go also. Yeah, many people, and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem, and to pray before the Lord. Thus, saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass, that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. What the apostles got instead of exaltation was persecution and scattering, Acts 8 verse 1, and Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. In the very next chapter, 
Paul is saved and given the revelation of the mystery by the risen Lord, with a promise of additional mystery information to follow, Acts 26 verses 16 to 17, But rise, and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people, and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, with the revelation of the mystery, the very men to whom the great commission was given rescinded those instructions because of the new information that had been given to Paul. Galatians 2 verses 7 to 9, But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. How very simple it is to see that Peter, in possession of the keys of the kingdom with binding and loosing power, seven bound on earth and in heaven that the great commission was no longer operative. At that point, Israel's apostles had no intention of going to every nation and all creatures, but to the circumcision only. This agreement, borne witness to in Acts chapter 15, has escaped the attention of churches for nearly 2,000 years. Just as certainly as the prophecy from Joel with respect to the sun and moon, which Peter properly repeated at Pentecost, did not come to pass, just that certainly the Great Commission was set aside by the men to whom the Lord himself gave that authority. Acts 2-16, 19-20 But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, I will shew wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood, and fire, and vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come, by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, Peter correctly said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Acts 2 verse 16 the fact that the items prophesied did not happen at that time declares the interruption of the prophetic program with that which Paul was to identify as the revelation of the mystery. The apostles did not see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, Matthew 24 verse 15, with the cessation of prophetic fulfillment and with the Lord saving uncircumcised Gentiles without the works of the law, eight the apostles confined their activities to those that constituted believing Israel, just as they agreed to do in Galatians chapter 2.9 there was a new message, a new messenger and a new pattern, all of which are easily discerned in the verses which remain a mystery to most people who call themselves Christians. Ephesians 3 verse 2, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, ward. 1 Timothy 1 verse 16, Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might shew forth all longsuffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Romans 11 verse 13, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office, all of the prophecies concerning the kingdom will be fulfilled, but their fulfillment has been postponed. For these many reasons, it clearly is wrong for members of the body of Christ according to the revelation of the mystery to claim Israel's Messiah or Israel's commissions. The Lord has a greater commission for us, a grace commission. 2 Corinthians 5 verses 19 to 20, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. 1. Matthew 15 verses 22 to 28 KJV. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts, and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she creeth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread, and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. 
2. Genesis 12 verse 3 And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. 3. Hebrews 9 verses 15 to 18 And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For, Romans 11 verse 11 I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their false salvation is come unto the Gentiles, for to provoke them to jealousy. 5. The Bible in English, David Daniel, Yale University Press, page 106. It is also illuminating to note the contradiction between Matthew 24 verse 14 and Colossians 1 verse 23 as mentioned earlier. 7. Matthew 16 verse 19 And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. 8. Acts 13 verse 38 Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. 9. Galatians 2 verse 9 And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. End of part one.